that's much better. Yes, hi. Whoa, are we? No, we're not loud enough. There we are. That's so much better. Hi. Yes, bonnet. Where's the bonnet? Da -da -da. Look at that blue. Look at those flowers. It is awesome. Okay, so what day is it? Wait, it's Monday. It, it's such a Monday. Hi. Monday, 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 Monday. What day is it? It is. Do, 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 do. Double checking my lighting. No, that would be bad. That would be good. Yes. So today is August the 10th, Monday. Hi, hi, hi. Oh, there's Bill Craft. Yeah. Monday the 10th. Am. It is. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, it's National Connecticut Day. People from Connecticut? Anyone in Connecticut? Hi, Connecticut, Connecticut. Yes, yes, bought it on. Is anyone from Connecticut today? Because it's national. Every state gets its day. And today happens to indeed be <gasps> National Connecticut Day. Da, da, da. Now, it is also National Lazy Day. Now, I did that Friday. <laughs> I did those. I was National Lazy Day around here. I could do National Lazy Day again. I'm totally into that. National laziness is, I, I'm up for laziness on certain days. That would totally be my thing. Oh. Mm. Quite warm again. Mm. It is also National Shapewear Day. Yes, girdles, girdles and such. Hey, I think this milk might be bad. I'm not going to drink that. National Shapewear Day. Um, which you will need if you celebrate, it is national, not making this up, s'mores day. Now, I use jumbo, Urgh! jumbo marshmallows. Okay, they're way too big, way too big. Terrible for s'mores, actually. They think, oh, the jumbo will be perfect. No, it's like a disaster. Um, I prefer my s'mores made over an open flame like barbecue. But I decided to say, what did you microwave it? How hard could it be? It's a mess. It is just a mess because, well, look, that's, that's one marshmallow. <laughs> it totally didn't work. It made a giant, huge effing mess. Um, yes, yes, I said, yes, I did. Frell. It was Frell, you know, from Farscape. Frelling. It made a frilling mess. But it, look at this, it's such a mess. Now, wait, I don't think I can even get this up off of the dish that I microwaved it. Ah, there we are. So it um, should be good. It's Trader Joe's milk chocolate and Trader Joe's super delicious um, graham crackers and the jumbo, jumbo marshmallows. But as you see, it just made this huge mess. So regular size marshmallows are the way to go. I did cut this in half and spread it across. It. No, I think if you cut it up and used a quarter of one, you might make a microwave s'more or do it for like two seconds. Now, over an open fire, it's quite lovely. It's still too darn big. So, do I even try? This is like a mess. Wait. <laughs> that's a big old mess. Oh, that's awful. I mean, it tastes good. It tastes incredible, but... No, that is a giant mess. That is like a disaster. So, um... Mm. The problem with the microwave... Several things happen. One, the marshmallow is overly melted. It puffs up. When you do it over an open flame, it just barely puffs up, and the outside gets crunchy and delicious. This microwave, it just gets hot and big. And the chocolate melts to liquid because it's in the microwave. And the graham cracker gets soft. So, microwaving a s'more really doesn't work that well. Do you know there's entire generations who've only had their microwaved s'mores? They've only had the microwave s'mores. They've not had real s'mores. We, um, I was at a Schoonover family event years ago when the nieces and nephews were young. And someone, they did a bonfire outdoors in the yard because it's like acres and acres long. And I said, awesome, let's make s'mores. And one of them looked at me because they were at grandma and grandpa's house and said, we don't have a microwave. How can we make s'mores? <laughs> There, there are children who believe you cannot make s'mores without a microwave. They do not know from camp or barbecue. Um, when you barbecue it, you barbecue your, your, your marshmallow roasted over an open fire. Your graham cracker then is still crisp. Your chocolate only melts when it comes in contact with the hot marshmallow. And the marshmallow isn't a giant mess. Oh. Oh. 
so messy. Um, so I may try something later involving an open fire <laughs> and get a real s'more. So that's not real s'more. It's interesting, but it's not a real s'more. I have a big old mess. Okay, I much. I'm gonna try a s'more today at some point today. But I'm going to, if I have to turn on the gas stove and put it on a fork over the, I'm going to do it that way because the, the microwave thing is, oh yeah, there's people who don't know how to make popcorn without a microwave. Again, pop, microwave popcorn is gross. Now, there's these things you can buy, and I have one, and it's this sort of rubberized silicone contraption, and you put your plain, plain popcorn kernels, unflavored, unbuttered, unadulterated popcorn kernels, in the plastic thingamajiggy and put it in the microwave. No oil. And they sort of air pop and they come out very nice and fluffy and it's like having an air popper. Um, I also have a Hello Kitty model air popper. Um, but the best way to make popcorn, unless you have open fire, you can do a fireplace thing, but the best way to make popcorn is you take a pot, you pan a pot on the stove with a lid, and you put a little tiny bit of oil, not olive oil, like the only safflower oil, whatever, mm -hmm. vegetable oil, a little tiny bit of oil, and then you put a couple, of, and then you make popcorn. You heat it up and you put the popcorn there and it pops. That's the best way to make popcorn. Um, air popper's good. The other way is to have the popcorn basket used over the fireplace. That's awesome. But the, the microwave popcorn's the best. And those bags, can you, it, it, the list of like weird things and chemicals and flavors and that, the butter, that, ooh, yeah. Microwave popcorn's crisp. I like my, I mean, I went anti-microwave. I have friends who are like, oh, microwaves, I did cook anything in the microwave. Microwaves are very handy. Um, you can thaw things. <laughs> and they do make the microwave air popper. Um, there are some things that are great in the microwave. And then there are things that are just disgusting <laughs> in the microwave. Great for getting them potatoes, like, cooked before you cook. So we're, um, yes, still at it. Do you know, and I was, I was raiding the, the back cupboard, uh, the, and I found, like, five more Bill Anderson books. So, Burr Oak, that, um, and this baby, this baby boy that the English have had, that Laura doesn't talk about in the books, and Burr Oak, that she doesn't talk about in the books, but that we totally did on the show. A year in Burr Oak, a year they spent. Almost everyone we meet is crying hard times if they live where the grasshoppers are, wrote Laura's grandmother, Holbrook. Grandma and the rest of the Quiner and the Ingalls relatives were all concerned to hear that Charles and Caroline and their girls had no home. Well, yeah, they were homeless. And the grandparents were like, what is going on? I wondered about that because remember we like read and kind of laugh and go, this Charles, Charles, he's so good looking. He plays the fiddle. He's charming. Great laugh. Terrible farmer. What is the deal? He's a nice guy. He's so nice to Carol and the children. Great with the children. Really kind to Carolyn. But man, this guy is bad at farming. His the Grasshopper weather. And he's like, what's grasshopper weather? Hello, it's locusts, you idiot. Um, terrible at choosing crops. Does not do well at this. Loses and and the in, land and the Indian. Oh, I'm not going to check the map, and I'm not even going to file a claim. The whole point of a homestead is you file the claim. You don't have a homestead if you don't file the claim. It doesn't exist. I'm not going to file the claim. But then they would have told you only had to move like a mile. It did, no. So he's like bad at this stuff. Um, what did the parents think? What did Caroline's parents, who were not poor, what did the Ingalls and what did these grandparents think when every time they turned around, the Ingalls and the children were starving? And, and, and living in holes in the ground and sleeping on floors. Like, what is going on? Well, they were concerned. Here, Charles, Caroline, their girls had no home. Although the families were widely separated, they learned news of each other through what they called the circulator. It was a letter mailed from family to family. Each added news to the bottom of the letter and passed it on. That's a very clever idea. That's very good. Grandma Holbrook wrote of Laura's family, I wonder when they will get a stopping place. I shall be glad for their sake. They have had a hard time of it ever since they left Pepin. When Pa drove the covered wagon to Uncle Peter's yard near South Troy, Minnesota, Laura forgot for a moment the hardships of the long trip and the fact that baby Freddie was often sick. Again, there were cousins to play with. So yeah, they went to visit the relatives and things got better. Uh, there were cousins to play with. Peter, Alice, Ella, Edith, and Lansford were almost like brothers and sisters to Laura and Mary and Carrie. Since Aunt Eliza, now, boy, follow this, make a flow chart for this one, the Ingalls family. Since Aunt Eliza was Ma's sister, Caroline's sister, and Uncle Peter was Pa's brother. 
Uncle Peter, Pa, Charles Ingalls' brother, Aunt Eliza, Caroline's sister, and they're married to each other and have eight million kids. So, yes, yeah, since Aunt Eliza was Ma's sister and Uncle Peter was Pa's brother, the children were all double cousins. That's why they were like brother and sister. Them They weren't just, just Pa's brother's kids or even and their Ma's sister's kids. They, they were both. Wee! Okay. Uncle Peter and Aunt Eliza urged Pa and Ma to stay with them for the rest of the summer. They were not needed in Burr Oak till autumn. Together, the two families totaled 13 people. With so many people in one house, there were many chores to do, and the children were kept busy. Mary and 14-year-old Alice worked along with Ma and Aunt Eliza cooking and tending the babies. Freddie, uh, for the babies, Freddie, and Lancer, Lancer was the other baby. Laura, Ella, and Peter were put in charge of the cows. That's good, Laura liked cows. Laura loved the daily task of watching the cows and guarding the haystacks that Pa and Uncle Peter had made. Oh, she loved them haystacks, but she'd mess them up, too. The Zumbro River flowed along the edge of Uncle Peter's pasture, and Laura and the cousins explored its banks. As their bare feet padded through the soft green grass, they were mindful of the tinkling cow bells and where the cows were. It would never do for a cow to wander off or to tear down the hay being saved for winter. Well, we know from the other books that Laura would jump on a haystack and mess that thing up every chance she got. It's like sliding down the hay, so you know she did it again there, too. Wild plums grew along the Zumbra River just as they had on Plum Creek. When one of the cousins found a cluster of them deep in a plum thicket, he or she would yell and the rest of the children would come clamoring for the juicy fruit. Sometimes they would light little fires and roast crab apples or bits of bread and meat. As sunset neared, the cousins found the cows, or the cows found them, and they all went back to the stable for milking time. Now that sounds bad. Now I'm wondering because she was so young when she got to Walnut Grove and didn't spend, and then they kept leaving, and she spent a lot of time with the cousins. I wonder how many stories. How many stories in On the Banks of Plum Creek of her childhood memories of cows in the creek actually happened in Borough, Iowa with the cousins. And she just kind of went, yeah, 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 I'll say that was then since she left. I wonder. Because mm -hmm. she had a really good time. She was having a very happy time there. It was a happy place for her. Mm -hmm. Through the long summer days, Laura worried about baby Freddie. See, this is why she left out. She just decided that whole section about baby Freddie's entire existence and his dying. She's just going, I just have to just delete the whole thing. She did worry. He was nine months old and sickly. Pa and Ma were so concerned that they had a doctor come in to examine the baby. The weeks were shadowed by his illness. Laura remembered the awful day, it was August 27, 1876, when Freddie straightened out his little body and was dead. It's a quote. Poor little thing. So they didn't know. And nine months. Now, in the show, well, it was a few days, a couple weeks or something. And then, yeah. No, he was not. He lived for nine months. So it wasn't like a child that dies right after birth. And I, I, we, we don't really know. Everyone says, oh, what did Freddie die of? Well, it was 1876. They didn't know what he died of. They hardly knew what anybody died of in 1876. Um, and he was a baby, and babies died a lot. So 1870, it could have been anything. Um, a lot of them, you know, a lot of people said, well, was it, was it like leukemia? I don't know, because in 1876, they would have no way of testing out in the country, testing a nine-month-old baby for leukemia. That wouldn't have been a thing. The doctor wouldn't have been able to say, oh, this is leukemia. And there doesn't appear to be any record of any doctor saying, oh, he has failure to thrive, he has leukemia, has a... SIDS wasn't invented yet. The name SIDS didn't exist. There's no such thing. Um, failure to thrive was sort of a term that was it covered a lot of ground. A lot of anything could be failure to thrive, but some illness that caused him to not gain weight and to stay sickly. Yeah, ah, there you go, John. Death certificate says diarrhea, which you kind of go, what? Hello, well, what was it? That that game, Oregon Trail, you have died of dysentery? Yeah, well, in the 1800s, if you got diarrhea, which as we now know is a symptom, not a disease, you get an infection of some kind and you may have diarrhea. If you have diarrhea, it doesn't stop. You dehydrate and you get very, very sick and you can die. And people who are in hospitals come down with things like oh, C. difficile or some illness that causes absolutely can die of diarrhea. Um, so it would be like dysentery. So he may have had an infection, and like I said, that they wouldn't know. 
they they've got millions of infections they didn't have names for then and they hadn't discovered yet. It could have been a virus. Did they had they even discovered what a virus was in 1876? The, the the all the diseases that weren't even discovered or named yet. So he had something that caused him to have diarrhea and not gain weight and get sicker and sicker. So did he have a disease? Did he have a genetic defect? Did he, had he, did he, was it a bacterial infection? Was it a viral infection? We don't know. You know, you know, he actually could have had was, um, oh gosh, the celiac, the thing, well, you know, now people talk about gluten and, and celiac disease, and that's an intestinal thing where you really, really, really cannot digest anything gluten, you get deathly ill. If he'd had that, they certainly would not have known it, but it would have caused him to die quite young. So, yeah, someone saying if he was born with a heart defect, how would they know? It's, it's not like he had a CAT scan, you know? I mean, it's 1876, so the, the mystery of what poor little Freddie died of, I'm afraid, we don't know. We do know that he was sickly from the reports the whole time he was alive, that he definitely had diarrhea, some kind of dysentery, so maybe an infection. But we don't really know what killed him, but the poor little thing, he could, they, whatever it was, they sure didn't have the medicine to correct it. There was nothing they could do back then. Poor guy. Not far from Uncle Peter's home, Charles Frederick Ingalls was buried under a little white gravestone. The sad days that followed were even sadder because Pa and Ma and the girls knew that soon they would have to leave Freddy behind. Isn't that terrible? They didn't, it's not like, he's not like buried in dismet or anywhere. Leave him behind in the little graveyard, but they would never forget him. So that's another thing. He's not, it's not like he's buried in dismet with the rest of the family. He's buried somewhere in Burr Oak, Iowa, in a little tiny churchyard, so that's like, Ur. pictures, there are a million pictures in this section, so this is Charles and Caroline Ingalls right after their 1860 wedding, they look kind of severe here, but people did in those old pictures, but he's got his arm around her, and that is kind of unusual, that's like, there you go, as severe as they look, because every, because you had to sit for a long time, it's the, the tin type, you kind of had to sit there, like, for a while. but his arms around her, and in those days, that was like passion. That was passionate public display of affection. Oh, he's got his arm around her. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Look at that there. So, maybe. Um, we have Char Carrie, Mary Ingalls. This is a famous picture. People see this one. This is like all the time. Everybody puts this in their books. Uh, is baby grass. Big, big, fat, chubby, cheap baby. Ingalls family posing for this board. This is Carrie and Laura and Grace and Ma and Pa and Mary. This is the whole gang. It's not quite easy to see Mary's like totally washed out, but you get the idea. And then Laura and Almanzo in dismet right a uh, uh, winter after their marriage. This is like they weren't they hadn't been married. They're still newlyweds. He's kind of cute. He's kind of good looking. Okay. Um, Rose Wilder at age three. Oh, yeah, yeah. She was difficult even then. I think it's a pout. Uh, Almanzo at work on Rocky Ridge Farm. Oh, we were talking about Rose and her donkey, Spookendike, that I was cracking up over. She had a donkey. This is actually a pretty good picture of her and um, Spookendike. I love her outfit. Okay, the hat and this dress. I want this hat and this dress. Is this, like, fabulous? Check out the fashion going on here. That's pretty cool. Um... Wilder House in the Village of Mansfield in 1907, and the completed home on Rocky Ridge Farm around 1913. So there you go. Which and this this looks exactly the same right now. And then there's the house there, but this this looks totally the same. Let me go see it. So the Minnesota autumn was cool and crisp when Pa and Ma loaded the wagon once again. It was time to meet their promise to be hotel keepers in Burr Oak, Iowa. Saying goodbye to Uncle Peter's family, Pa drove the wagon south. They crossed the Minnesota state line into the state of Iowa. Burr Oak was just three miles away. Let's put that. So they went out there to Western Minnesota, so South Troy, Minnesota. So somewhere near South Troy, Minnesota is where baby Freddie was buried. So, <sighs> so Burr Oak, when Pa's wagon rumbled into the village of Burr Oak and drove down the long main street, Laura saw immediately. It was far different from the fresh western newness of Walnut Grove. Burr Oak, Laura said, was an old town built of red brick 
I liked the new town better, and I knew Pa did, too. That's right. Yeah, that's the thing. All this new stuff, this prairie stuff. But they're, by 1876, they're places that, I mean, heaven forbid they were back east in Massachusetts or something where there's been things from the 1600s. So this is, you know, brick buildings. At an earlier time, Burr Oak had been on the crossroads of the Western movement. Go. The road going north led to Minnesota. The trail from the banks of the Mississippi ran westward through Burr Oak across Iowa, Nebraska, and all the way to the Pacific coast. Sometimes as many as 200 covered wagons had stopped to spend the night in Burr Oak. It's a happening place. The pioneers would camp in clusters along the tall oak groves or stop in the yards of the, the neat brick homes. There was a brick mill in the village and a stone quarry nearby, so many of the buildings were constructed of stone or brick. Hey, I bet they're probably, like, kind of still there, too, after a bit of that, yeah. There were two hotels still doing business in Burr Oak when the Ingalls family arrived. The, biz the busiest was the American House. The stagecoach made its stops there. The other hotel was the Burr Oak House. Some called it the Master's Hotel. Ah, it's sounding familiar now. For its most recent owner had been William Masters. That was where Pa stopped the wagon. The hotel was the new home of the Ingalls family. The Burr Oak House seemed very grand to Laura. It was built on a hill that sloped down to Silver Creek. Silver Lake, Silver Creek. The lower level of the hotel included the kitchen, the dining room, and the sleeping space. From the street, doors opened to the tavern room, the hotel office, and the parlor. A big bedroom off the parlor was occupied by Mr. Bisbee, the richest boarder. Upstairs were four small sleeping rooms. That's not a very big hotel, was it? Had like five guests. Behind the hotel was a barn and a spring house built over a flowing brook. Laura was often called to fetch butter and milk from the spring house where it was kept ice cold. A fish pond was in the yard and Silver Creek angled across the lot full of speckled trout. Ah, <gasps> trout. I love trout. Do you like trout? Oh, look, see there. Jamie's done it. Find a grave. There is a, there is, you can find um, little Freddie Ingalls grave. Uh, Laura described the Burr Oak House as altogether a very fine place. The hotel was a busy establishment. Visitors constantly came and went, and three times a day, hungry guests lined the long dining tables in the lower level of the hotel. Dances and weddings sometimes were held there. Some people lived at the hotel permanently. They were called the steady boarders and were treated with extra care. Mr. and Mrs. Stedman with their three boys, Johnny, Reuben, and Tommy, had already settled into the hotel when the Ingalls family arrived. Stedman, is that what we call on the show? God, I can't remember. Uh, okay, you guys are gonna remember this morning. On the show, when everybody moved to Winoka or whatever made up thing we called it, that was supposed to be Baroque, and they were at the hotel, wasn't it the Master's Hotel? I think they called, I don't remember. Wasn't there a Mr. Stedman? Didn't we have a made up character, a Mr. Stedman? This is sounding terribly familiar. Um, oh, so was it you toured the hotel last? Teresa toured the hotel last summer. It's not very big. You can't socially distance. Um, bed space. Wow, that's right. You rented bed space. I was wondering, they have five rooms. How many people could they have? I guess they jammed them all in. Um, Standish. Standish. That was it. Stand we had a Standish. Because I'm thinking, I'm thinking some of these names snuck their way into like scripts on the show. Cause it's sounding all very familiar here. Mm hmm. So the Stedmans, we have a bunch of kids here, um, it had been agreed that Pa and Ma would help operate the hotel with the Stedmans in exchange for living space and a part of the profits. So I guess when we invented the Garveys, the kid didn't even know it was supposed to be, eh? Pa immediately became very busy helping around the hotel. Ma worked hard with Mrs. Stedman, the hired girl, doing the cooking, cleaning, and laundry. Mary and Laura made beds, washed dishes, and waited on tables. Mrs. Stedman also begged the girls to watch her youngest boy, Tommy. Now, when on the show, when we had them at the hotel, indeed, you had Ma working in the kitchen and washing and Pa doing it, working around the hotel. Um, but indeed, they had, they had drinking and gambling. Um, and it was shocking because Ma was having to, like, serve liquor. And so they were kind of like, oh, they got to go back to Walnut Grove. Um, but in the show, I don't recall them having like Laura and Mary and Carrie making beds in a hotel and like serving people in a hotel. They did. They did. Yikes. Amy, the hired girl, 
they always have these poor kids they call the hired girl. It's like, wow. Because the Ingalls and the Stedmans were working there, but they're like employees. They're not called the hired girl. What terrible, terrible lower echelon economically in society, why, socially, did you have to be that you were referred to then as the hired girl? They had lots of people who were hired. They had waiters and waitresses and kitchen staff and the Ingalls and the Stedmans. And then the hired girl who's like something else. <sighs> It doesn't sound good. It sounds borderline like slavery. Like the hired girl probably didn't get paid much. Don't think she had benefits included in her check. I did. It doesn't sound good. Poor child. Amy, the hired girl, knew many stories about the people who previously owned the hotel and about the guests too. So now you think that she would have been a regular employee and kind of more high ranking, but she was somehow still the hired girl. Hmm. Someone said chamber pot emptier. Yes, I think that's the gig she got. When Laura asked Amy about the hole in the dining room door, she learned it was a bullet hole. It had been made by the son of Mr. Masters, the former owner of the hotel. Will Masters' wife had been running from him because he was drunk. She had slammed the kitchen door and Will had shot his gun right through it. The bullet hole in the door was thrilling to us children, Laura said. Scandal. Scandal and murder. Oh, the higher girl didn't come every day. Okay, well, she's like a temp. Part time. Uh, pa and Ma were concerned when they saw that a saloon stood next door to the hotel. It was this very saloon that attempted Will Masters. The reason his father had sold the hotel was to take Will far away from the saloon out west to Walnut Grove. See, this is sounding like plot lines from the show where the guy is bringing his son to, like, you know, rehab out in the country in Walnut Grove. So there you go. The Burr Oak School was a brick building with two rooms not far from the hotel. Mary and Laura started attending along with the Stedman boys. Because, yeah, this is all before Mary went blind, so she was having to work. Um, perhaps, uh, oh, perhaps Carrie enrolled, too. She was past six. We don't know. Miss Sarah Donlan was the teacher in the primary room. William Reed was the secondary teacher and principal. Laura knew him well because he lived at the hotel. Teachers at the hotel, you're changing the teacher's sheets. Doing the teacher's laundry. Ooh, it's all way too close and communal. I did it, no, I could I could be too weird for me. Um around Christmas time, a group of big scuffling farm boys started coming to school. Oh no, we've heard this plot line. Not to learn, but to be unruly and to drive Mr. Reed out of town. Oh, we did have this, we totally had this plot in the books, and we totally had this plot on the show, but it was in Burr Oak. They boasted to the crowd in the saloon that Reed would be gone after Christmas. The worst of the boys was named Mose. He led the others in mischief and noise. When he walked into the schoolroom tardy, Mr. Reed quietly asked him to come to his desk. Laura said the rest of the students sat spellbound, hoping that Mr. Reed would not get hurt. But quickly, as Mose approached the desk, Mr. Reed tripped him. Mose fell across the teacher's knees and was whipped soundly with a ruler. <gasps> when Mr. Reed was through, Mose walked through the door and never returned. Which is probably for the best. His friends also skulked away, and school went on peacefully. Yeah, those guys didn't need to be there. They weren't into it. That's it. That was just all for the best. Y'all, y'all need to go. So yeah. Someone's going, didn't this happen in Farmer Boy? Yeah. And didn't this happen like in By the Shores of Silver Lake? And so no. Except for some sledding down the long hill behind the hotel, Christmas was not very happy for Laura. The family still missed Freddie. Though Ma was expecting a new baby in the spring. Oh boy. The work in the hotel kept Pa and Ma too occupied to plan for holidays. Besides, there was no place in the crowded hotel to celebrate. Oh, no. And then the Ingalls girls and the Stedman boys all got the measles. Which, back then, could totally kill you. There you go. Laura knew that Pa and Ma were talking of leaving the hotel. But before that happened, Laura was forced to spend hours with the best-paying boarder in the hotel, Mr. Bisbee. Okay, where is this story going exactly? How old is Laura? Laura was forced to spend hours with the best paying boarder in the hotel. And I'm, I'm concerned. Um, ah, okay. 
this is really, that's even crazier than the horrible things one would be thinking of nowadays. Ah, he decided to teach Laura to sing. I did not know. She did not mention this story. This is very apt. And every day she had to practice the musical scales he taught her. Over the sounds of the noisy hotel, Laura sang patiently, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti. <laughs> okay, like that's weird. Um, so Laura was like kidnapped and forced to take singing lessons. <laughs> this is... Okay. Pa and Ma found rooms to rent over the grocery store two doors from the hotel on the other side of the saloon. That sounds like a good idea. I'd get the heck out of there. Yeah, the family moved into the quiet, pleasant apartment for the rest of the winter. Yeah, yeah, just, just even down the street. Just, I don't be living in that same thing with Mr. Bisbee. That all sounds very weird. Very weird. Pa worked at a mill where farmers came to have their corn and wheat ground up. Pa's horses were hitched to a millstone and walked around a circle grinding the grain. So, okay, so now that makes sense. That's how we suddenly had like a mill in Walnut Grove. The, the mill stories. And, yeah. The Ingalls girls enjoyed school during the winter of 1877. Mary had received the independent fifth reader for her 12th birthday on January 10th. The book contained wonderful stirring poems, speeches, and stories such as Paul Revere's Ride, The Village Blacksmith, Bears Out for a Holiday, Bears, Bears, and Snowbound. Ooh. Mr. Reed was an elocutionist who taught the girls how to read aloud with feeling and emotion. Laura said she was always grateful for this training. Pa told her later that a crowd of men used to gather in the grocery store just below the Ingalls sitting room to listen while she and Mary recited and practiced their reading lessons. Well, that's pretty good. They must have, you know, they, they had a day. We're drawing a crowd. Pa and Ma's worries about the saloon next door came true late one night. It caught fire and Ma awakened Mary, Laura, and Carrie, telling them to dress quickly in case the place started burning too. Ma and the girls stood by the front windows, looking down at a group of Burr Oak men lined up in front of the town pump. They had started a bucket brigade to pass the filled pails down the line to be poured on the flames, but the line seemed to be standing still. That's what you had to do back then. There's no fire trucks. People did a bucket brigade. They literally just in, in by hand. Ma kept saying, why don't they hurry? Nothing moved. Finally, Pa gave a shout and jerked Mr. Bisbee away from the flowing pump. In his panic, he'd been pumping water into a pail with no bottom, screaming, fire, but doing nothing to stop the blaze. What is it? Okay, Mr. Bisbee, there's something the matter with Mr. Bisbee. At last, the saloon fire was put out. Pa came in tired and smoky and grumbling. He told the girls that if the darn saloon could have burned without taking the rest of Burr Oak, he would have let it happen. He wouldn't have cared, carried one drop of water to save a wild saloon like that. Pa and Ma didn't like their girl so near the saloon, so they rented a bit red brick house on the edge of Burr Oak for Mr. Bisbee, and the family moved again. That's probably a good idea. So wait, so on the show, again on the show, that we're supposed to be totally historically inaccurate, and right, on the show, didn't we have the saloon? burst into flames and there were fireworks and there was a big old fire and the hotel burned and everybody had to put it in and that's like when they left. Oh wait, that actually happened. So there you go. Let's see. Who, right, why? We, as, as Teresa just said, why, why would you have a bucket with no bottom? That doesn't make any sense. Who is this Bisbee? So Bisbee is dragging little girls to his room to take singing lessons and then he's running around with a bucket with no bottom in it. And, and screaming fire. What, was he involved? Was there an insurance angle to this? I mean, I would stay, <laughs> I would stay very far from Mr. Bisbee. So they moved again, renting from Mr. Bisbee, which is a bad idea, I'm sure. But at least they moved further from this crazy town and the saloon. The comfortable house stood near an oak woods, and everyone was happy to be there. Pa had bought a cow, yay, and once again Laura had the job of taking the cow to the pasture in the morning and bringing her home at night. Laura was 10 and had to wear shoes all day, but she always went barefoot to get the cow. She was 10 when she was working in a hotel and making beds, and 10 when some dude named Mr. Bisbee said she had to come for singing lessons. This would not, nobody would go along with the story today. They'd go, you're 10, no, come back here. 
Springtime in Burr Oak was green and fresh and sweet smelling with the scent of wildflowers and newly plowed black fields. School started getting long and tedious and Laura was happy when the end drew close. She had worked hard to learn her multiplication tables that year and after many mistakes, she finally mastered them. Laura was busy helping Ma that spring because a new baby was soon to be born. Yay! One day, Laura recalled, when I came back from an errand that had taken me a long time, I found a new little sister. Her hair was golden like Mary's and her eyes were bright and blue like Pa's. So basically, every time a baby's born, they send Laura to the store, like, go, go visit the Indian camp up the hill and get some beads. Go run an errand. Go boil water. <laughs> go to the store. And, and miraculously, the baby's always born while she's at the store. It's amazing. Oh, the date was May 23rd, 1877, and the name Pa and Ma chose for their fourth daughter was Grace Pearl. Oh, that's pretty. Baby Gracie. Yeah. That was a delightful summer, Laura remembered. Work and play were so mixed that I could not tell them apart. Helping to tend Grace was fun. Taking and bringing the cow marked mornings and evenings, and playing with Carrie and Mary and their friends kept Laura busy. Pa worked all summer for whoever would hire him. He could help on farms or work as a carpenter, but his wages were not enough to support a big family of four growing girls. Laura was not surprised to hear him talk of going west again. The summer days were so long and happy and the brick house was so comfortable that Laura never thought her family was poor. But other people in Baroque did and thought they could help Ma and Pa out by, by raising one of the girls. Oh, hi, hi. You seem to be having a little trouble financially. Can we have one of your children? Now, now, we did it. There was a thing. There was a thing in the books where somebody tried to buy a kid, right? So Laura did talk about somebody trying to buy a kid in the books. And some people wanted to buy Rose from Laura Almanzo. You know, you think people are just giant weirdos now, but apparently, um, there you go. Dr. and Mrs. Starr were among Burr Oak's most important citizens. They liked Laura very much. And one afternoon, oh dear, when she came in from bringing the cow home, Laura saw Mrs. Starr talking earnestly with Ma. She was saying that her girls, Ida and Fanny, were grown and away teaching, and she was lonely for a girl around her big house. She and the doctor had talked it over, and they wanted Pa and Ma to give them Laura. <laughs> yeah, we talked it over, and we think you should just give us one of your kids. That one there. No, not the eldest. This is the middle one. It's, yeah. What is the matter with people? What is the matter with people? <laughs> and they just thought, did they think this would go over? They thought, what did they think that people would go, oh, that's a good idea here. Do you want the baby too? We could throw him in. <sighs> Ma listened politely. Okay, how many people here would have listened politely to, hi, I need to buy your kid? I don't think politely would have been I don't think even my mother would have sat still for that story. My mother would have gone, really? You don't say. Ma listened politely, but much to Laura's great relief, she said that she and Pa could not possibly spare their Laura. Mrs. Starr went away very sad to her empty house. When Laura thought of her offer and of life without her own family, she tried to forget Mrs. Starr's visit as quickly as she could. I don't know how polite I would be. <laughs> Like, I'm sorry, what is the matter with you? <laughs> Just trying to, I'm trying to make my mother's face. She'd be like, what? <laughs> Paul was restless, thinking of the West and how hard he had to work to stay in a place he did not like and where neighbors came and attempted to purchase your children when they're not kidnapping them to teach them singing lessons. Yeah, they need to get... I'm starting to see why Laura said I'm not going to write about Burroke in the book. I'm just going to skip that whole section where the baby brother dies and neighbors try to steal me and all these weirdo people in the saloon and the hotel. I can see why she just went, yeah, we're not... We're not we're just, no. Because <laughs> it's, it's all kind of terrible. And Pa has realized this is awful. His fiddle played marching, moving songs. He wanted to go west again, and he knew that Walnut Grove suited him better than Burroke. He sold the cow and the covered and covered the wagon once more. 
Very early one cool autumn morning before sunrise, Pa and Ma finished loading the wagon and helped their sleepy girls inside. Before the sun rose, they had driven the three miles to the Minnesota state line. Burr Oak was behind them. They were back in Minnesota, and Pa turned the wagon west. We were all so happy about going west again, Laura recalled. So the whole thing on the show where they left and went to this town and worked at a hotel, oh, and it caught fire, and then they left and went back to Walnut Grove, how will all that actually happen? So everyone who watched the show and said, oh, you people making stuff up. That's not in the book. Yes, yes, it happened. It happened. It happened. It really happened. And there was a baby that died, and we put all that in the show. Neener, neener, neener. We were historically accurate. Ta-da! But, yeah, this is crazy. So the West, yes, the West was best. She knows. Laura thought of the past year as the wagon applauded on the way back to Walnut Grove. They had lost Freddie, but gained Grace. They had lived in many places among many people. Pa had learned that an old crowded place was not for him. I know that Pa was happy, Laura said at their return to western Minnesota. The fiddle music he played along the road west was rousing and rollicking. To the stars, Pa played and sang, marching through Georgia, the star-spangled banner, Yankee Doodle, and the Arkansas Traveler. To Laura, Burr Oak seemed like a dream from which we had awakened. And none too soon. <laughs> I had a couple of offer half a million dollars to my mom to be able to adopt me in the 90s. So they guarantee it. People are bonkers. Well, at least they offered half a million dollars. I mean, that would make you feel pretty good. At least you were worth <laughs> half a million dollars. I don't think this woman, what was this woman even offering the angles? Go take Laura off their hands. Did she, did she even have like a check with her? I bet she, she didn't offer half a million dollars. That's clear. I'm, I'm glad your mother didn't sell you for half a million dollars. But um, that, that is at least... <laughs> At least you can say, hey, I somebody would have was willing to pay a half a million dollars. Um, it's terrible. People in Burr Oak were weird. No wonder. It's awful. The baby died, and then they live in a town full of weirdos. Um, so, yes, that's that's why they went back to Walnut Grove. So it's really weird because, like, you read the books, and it's like they're here, then they're here, then suddenly they're over here, and you're going, how old is she again? Wait, what? Oh, and then go, they're gone from Walnut Grove. But then you read in the show... They're in Walnut Grove, and they just stay there, stay there, stay there, and then they leave, and then they come back, and they stay there. And then you read this, and it's like, nyeh, 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 and she's all over the map. It's like, ooh, so they went to Kansas, and then they went to, no, then they went back to Wisconsin. Then they went to Walnut Grove. Then they said, no, oh, there's a side trip to Baroque. Oh, with a side trip to eastern Minnesota, to Troy. And then back to Walnut Grove again. And then they went to Dismet. I mean, my head is spinning. She was all over the place. And and so the idea in the books that they, she went here, she went here, she went here, <laughs> there's a lot of backtracking. So I can see where that would be confusing and why when writing the books, she said, this is way too confusing. I am not doing this. And then we went here and then we went back and then we went to, you know, she just, so she just went in this, we were here, we were here, we were here. Except when you read them as an adult, you go, there's something missing here. What? And that's why you never know what year it is. Remember I was reading the books, I said, she never says what year it is. She goes, oh, is it Christmas already? And, like, doesn't know that it's December. It's like, they had calendars in the 1800s. People had calendars on their walls. They had clocks. She never knows what time it is, never knows what year it is. And they're going, how old is she? And then, like, way, like, two books later, they'll go, she was now eight. And you go, isn't she, like, five? Like, and she never says how old she is, and she never says what year it is. And then, finally, once they're in Dismet, all of a sudden, Pa says... Yes, 1885 is going to be a great year. And all of a sudden, they're talking about what day it is, what, that, what month it is, and they're getting really specific. And you go, well, she's older. The other books are about when she was a little kid and didn't have a sense of time. No. The early books, she was making stuff up. And she couldn't say what year it was because it wouldn't make any sense because they went, bing, bing, boom, boom, but because they went this year, this year, oh, this year, oh, back this year, and then that year they went over here, and then they went... And that is why she doesn't say what year it is or how old she is in the first several books. Ta-da! So it's craziness. So yeah, we, on the show, it is weird, and we thought it was weird while we were shooting it. Um, we knew that we kept diverging from the books. It was like, the books said this, and then we do this, and then we do something that was just like the books, and then we do something. But as you read, we go, well, she did have a baby brother named Freddie who tragically died. 
and that's not in the books, but it was in real life, and uh, that made it into the show. And in the book, she doesn't go to Burrock, Iowa and work at a hotel, but oh, abracadabra, she does on the show. So we did stuff on the show that actually happened. I was like, it's so confusing. Um, and then we made stuff up completely, like Mary magically finds a hot, blind husband and runs a school uh, instead of just going to college and making things out of beats. And, and Nellie, instead of going to Tillamook, Oregon and marrying a guy named Henry Curry and having three kids, uh, marries a nice Jewish boy named Percival and, and has twins. So we made stuff up. We made stuff up like that. Show the cover. Oh, the book cover of the book. Yes, yes. We're here. Very, very, very pretty. This is, it's called A Biography, Laura Ingalls Wilder by William Anderson. You ch you look up William Anderson. I mean, it's, 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 it's so many books. Anything William Anderson wrote, he must be loving this. Does he know I'm doing this? Anything William Anderson writes, it's great. He's got little short books. It's like Laura's Time and blah, 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 that focus on different family members. But that William Anderson, he, you know, he knows his stuff. And he's, he's a great guy. And um, he, like I said, he's been to all the prairie says He speaks at a lot of events. He's a smart guy. So there you are. Um, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow is Tuesday. Okay, we made it through s'mores. I'm going to make a real s'more because that, that looks terrible. That's not a s'more. It's a big, giant, exploded marshmallow and bad crackers. So we made it through that. The 11th. Ooh. What's with the raspberries? Everything. Remember there was raspberry cake and raspberry cheesecake and raspberry cake. There's another raspberry thing happening. I don't know. I'm looking at them. Hmm, hmm. I'm looking at them. Hmm. No, I'm not going to make that. I'm not going to make I might make that. Oh. I'm bad. i got to make notes of, like, things to pick up at the store. <laughs> But be sure to have some of those. Uh-oh. Lemon meringue pie day is coming up. If I make a really good lemon meringue pie, I might have to do that. Okay, so um, there. That's what's happening. So tomorrow, 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 which will be oh, it's the 11th. Where did it all go? Um, yes, um, the cats. The cats are starting to almost get along. They're almost getting along. Morticia is almost, almost playing with Roswell. She's still kind of like, ugh. Ugh, was this new cat. Um, Roswell is hilarious, but she does um, like to go berserk and jump in things and, and jump in the plants. And she gets very excited. She's very excited. She starts chasing things. And we're like, yeah, chase it. And then she starts knocking over furniture while she's chasing things. And we're like, yes, time for you to go in the other room for a few minutes. Um, but she, she's pretty good. She's pretty good. Oh, where do I get my recipe? Oh, gosh. What do I, I have an entire, like, wall of cookbooks. And I learned to cook when I was a wee thing. And some of my recipes are like... Are mine. I'm just saying. Um, so there you are. There you are. So um, tomorrow, tomorrow, 1.30, I will see you. And getting the hair is kind of looking good today. I kind of like this. I'm never cutting it again. I'm never cutting it. Uh, <laughs> and um, so take care and wear your masks and wash your hands. And I will <gasps> see you tomorrow. Call your friends. Call your friends. Check it out.